Hello, my name is uh, Tim Colson and I'm Professor of Zoology at Jesus College and at Oxford University. And I thought that while we're in lockdown, it might be interesting to record a little bit about the role of diseases in animal populations. As we know, the coronavirus that we're all uh, locked down because of at the moment jumped species. And we're not entirely sure where it came from, but biologists think possibly it came from either pangolins or for bats. And it's true that every now and again, diseases can, can cross the species barrier, jump jumping from one species to another. A really nasty example of that is something like Ebola, which can come from primates into humans. But what do we know about the role of disease in animals? Well, actually, we know quite a lot. And so what I thought I'd do is I'd just give a few examples here so people get an idea. First of all, many species on islands that have been on islands for a long time have escaped from the diseases that their ancestors on the mainland may have suffered. And a consequence of this is that when new diseases that they haven't experienced over their evolutionary history for some time arrive on the islands, they can actually cause major extinctions. This has happened with avian malaria. So avian malaria is um, malaria, obviously, but it, it, it's caught by birds, by many bird species. And the birds that had adapted to Hawaii had been there for many years without malaria. But what happened is people brought the insect vectors that spread malaria and avian malaria to Hawaii. And once they did this, this spread into many of the native birds and it led to the extinction of a number of species. So in the really worst examples, it's entirely possible for diseases to drive species extinct, particularly if a new disease arrives in a, a population that's vulnerable to it because it has no means of immunity against the disease and no means of defending against it. There are a number of other cases of diseases where a disease outbreak hasn't driven a population extinct but has caused a major decline in numbers. One example of this comes from the wildebeest population in the Serengeti that during the 1960s was decimated by a disease called rinderpest. Rinderpest is also a disease that other ungulates, including livestock, can get. Rinderpest was eventually uh, um, eradicated in livestock through vaccines and um, uh, eventually died out within the wildebeest population. So once again, there's an example where disease can have a significant dramatic effect on populations. And indeed, as the wildebeest population declined, we also saw declines elsewhere in the population, including, for example, in some of the predators, such as lions, that fed on the wildebeest. So if a prey population is impacted by a disease, then species it interacts with, such as its predators, can also be negatively affected. But disease can also have evolutionary effects on species. And one bit of research that postdoc of mine studied a while ago was looking at diseases in wolves in Yellowstone. And this was a really ex interesting example. So what happened in Yellowstone National Park is wolves had been driven extinct back in the 1920s, but were reintroduced into the park in the mid-1990s, and their population established. It grew from 41 wolves to about 100 that live in the park today. In fact, in the state surrounding Yellowstone Park, there's about 1,600 wolves at the moment. So it's a very successful reintroduction story. But these wolves, every few years, they catch a disease called canine distemper virus, or CDV. And CDV is a bit like measles. So it's measles for carnivores. And it's not only wolves can, that can get it, but a number of other species in the ecosystem can also suffer from canine distemper virus. For example, coyotes that look a little bit like foxes can catch it. Mountain lions can catch it. Skunks, raccoons, uh, all sorts of other animals within the ecosystem can suffer from this disease. 
Most animals recover, but many of the pups, so the young of the year, can die when a canine distemper virus outbreak occurs. Now, interestingly, as a little bit of an aside, but becomes important to the story, as you'll see, the wolves in Yellowstone, they're all grey wolves in terms of that's a species name, but they come in two different colours. They come in a grey variety and a black variety. They're all the same species, but there are two different morphs, colour morphs. And for people have been wondering why these two different colour morphs existed for some time. And an argument was made that the black wolves, which typically occur further south, they are black because it enables them to hunt better in forested habitats. As you go further north, the forests become less abundant and you see more grey wolves. And the argument was that the grey wolves, which are seen more frequently up north, their frequency increases in the population. The argument was that they didn't need the black coloration because they didn't have to hunt in shaded areas. However, this hypothesis, although at first light seemed quite interesting, it doesn't really make very much sense. And it doesn't make sense because wolves run down their prey. They're not like cats, like lions, that sneak up on their prey and jump on them. So they use camouflage and they like to remain hidden. Wolves will uh, run at their prey from quite a distance and they'll course them down until the prey uh, uh, tires and can get caught. Now, we did some work, so we'll come back to that story in a little bit, but we did some work on the wolves in Yellowstone and we investigated how the black and the grey coat colour influenced survival. And we found that there were differences between survival between the black wolves and the grey wolves. Now, the black wolves come in two different varieties. So there's two different genotypes that can generate a black wolf. So there's a, a, a locker, so a bit of DNA in the wolves called CBD103. And this bit, this gene, determines whether a wolf is black or grey. And there are two forms of that gene. There's an A form and a B form. And if you are AA, so you have two of the A forms, that means you will be a grey wolf. If you are AB, so you have one A type and one B type, you will be a black wolf. And if you are BB, so you have two of the black types, one from your mum and one from your dad, that means that you are also a black wolf. Now, we took long-term records from the wolves to look to see how they survived and how successfully they reproduced. And we found that the BB black wolf had much lower survival and reproduction than the AB black wolf. Now, this is interesting because they both look the same. They both have a black coat, but they differ in their ability to survive and their ability to reproduce. So this tells us something. This tells us that the black coat colour per se probably isn't what the gene CBD103 is selecting for. In fact, it must be selecting for something else. And so what colleagues of mine did is they started exploring whether this gene might be involved in immunity. And the reason they did this is this type of gene is called a beta defense locus. And so what this means is we thought that it might be involved in fighting diseases like canine distemper virus. And through a course of experiments, uh, uh, it, the gene has now been identified as playing a key role in various types of immunity. And so we went back to Yellowstone and we actually then asked the question about whether the uh, the grey wolf and the two types of black wolves, whether their survival and their reproduction happened to differ in years when the canine distemper virus outbroke versus years when it did not. And we found something really interesting or a hint of something really interesting. We found that the AB black wolf, so the black heterozygote, had higher fitness than either the grey wolf or the black homozygote, i.e. the black BB wolf, 
in years when canine distemper virus outbreaks. So what this means is if you're an AB wolf, so you have one of each of the different genotypes, when there's a canine distemper outbreak, you have higher fitness than the grey wolf or the other type of black wolf, the BB. When there are not canine distemper viruses, the grey wolf, the AA wolf, and the black AB wolf have very similar fitnesses. So what we did is we examined whether the frequency at which canine distemper virus um, disease outbreaks might influence the uh, frequency of the black wolf within the population. And our model suggested this. They suggested when that, that when canine distemper virus outbreaks very infrequently, so it it doesn't really occur very often, we would expect to see very, very few black wolves and a much higher frequency of grey wolves. In contrast, when canine distemper virus outbreaks quite frequently, we would expect to see a higher frequency of black wolves. And indeed, there is some evidence that that might be the case. As you go down from the far north of North America, to the far south of the wolves range, you see that black wolves get more frequent. And this appears to correlate with whether canine distemper virus outbreaks frequently or not. But there's a further twist to this story. So if you're a grey wolf and you live in an environment where canine distemper virus occurs and outbreaks every now and again, you would like to try and produce black offspring. And so the way that you would do that is you would try and mate with a black wolf. And similarly, if you're a black wolf, you don't know what genotype you are, whether you're an AB or a BB. But the way to maximise the number of black offspring you would have would be to mate with an AA grey wolf. And so when you get two individuals with... When you, when you get individuals with different phenotypes, so different coat colours in this, this uh, case, that actively try and seek out a mate with the phenotype that differs from them, that's known as disassortative mating. And we were able to demonstrate and predict that when canine distemper virus outbreaks quite frequently, then we would expect to see the evolution of disassortative mating. And indeed, we find that in Yellowstone. Black wolves are more likely to mate with grey wolves than they are with other black wolves, and grey wolves are more likely to mate with black wolves than they are with one another. However, we also predict that if you go further north to areas where black wolves don't occur very frequently and where canine distemper virus doesn't occur, we would expect to see a different mating pattern. If you're a grey wolf, you want to produce grey offspring. So you should assortatively mate. So you should try and mate with someone else with a grey wolf. And we haven't been able to test this hypothesis yet, but that's one of the things we would like to do. We would love to do a study further north to see whether wolves assortatively mate. So what does all this mean? That's actually quite a complicated story that we've put together. But what it means is that evolution not only can influence the population dynamics of species by causing crashes in numbers of, individual, of, of animals of some species, it can not only cause extinction, as we saw in Hawaii in the case of avian malaria, but it can also lead to evolution of mating systems and of maintenance of variation in coat colour in these wolves. So disease can be incredibly important, not only in the short term in animal populations, but also over the longer term in terms of um, evolutionary effects. Now, in recent years, these sorts of studies, the studies of wildebeest in the Serengeti, of canine distemper virus in the wolves and of avian malaria in wildlife populations 
has led to a huge amount of interest in disease in wild populations. And biologists are starting to get a really good understanding now of the circumstances when diseases outbreak and can cause major population declines, when they cause less severe population declines, when they can cause extinction, and some of the evolutionary pressures that these diseases can generate. And one thing that's clear, the hosts of diseases, so various animal species, and their diseases are often what's called an evolutionary arms race. So they impose selection upon one another. So what you will see is that sometimes the disease might get an upper hand and it might spread through the animal population reasonably quickly. Whilst other times immune defence might evolve and the animals might have an upper hand and they actually suppress the frequency of the disease. And these things go backwards and forwards, go backwards and forwards, and we see ongoing changes in what's known as a co-evolutionary arms race between the disease and the animals. And indeed, there are some experiments that are ongoing at the moment where people will store diseases, um, uh, put them in freezers or what have you, and then they will infect individuals that have had an opportunity to evolve in the presence of the disease to see whether the ancestral type of the disease is less virulent and spreads less easily than the more evolved types. And indeed, when people do that in various insects and fish populations, that's exactly what they find. So there's good evidence of these ongoing evolutionary arms races. Now, in many cases, diseases can cross over from wildlife into um, humans, but also into other species. And an example of this that caused a lot of, has caused a lot of issues for dairy farmers within the UK comes from a disease called Uh, tuberculosis, and in particular bovine tuberculosis. And many of you will have heard in the news over the last few years discussions about the role that badgers play in bovine TB. Now bovine TB, when it gets into cattle, is an awful disease for the farmers because it means they have to kill their cattle and they are unable to uh, sell milk from infected individuals into the market or indeed meat from those individuals. So it's an issue that's cost farmers and the British economy a significant amount of money. And biologists have been keen to try and understand how this disease is spread and how it might be reduced. Now, the disease can exist in badgers and badgers can spread the disease to cattle and cattle can spread the disease to badgers. And there have been a number of trials and a number of cases where badgers are killed in an attempt to try and reduce bovine TB. But these have met with varied success, often limited. So in these cases, what biologists attempt to do is to try and find other routes in order to protect both the wildlife, but also the livestock from these diseases. And much in the same way that biologists and medics create vaccines for humans, we can collect, we can, um, we, we can create vaccines for animals. And in this case, there are vaccines that have been developed for both badgers and for livestock. And hopefully within the coming years, we will be in a position when using these vaccinations, we are really able to help to contribute to the reduction of bovine tuberculosis in livestock, but also in the wildlife, so also in the badgers. And that's a significant amount of ongoing work. But just to finish this tale and these thoughts about disease and wildlife, it's worth returning to COVID-19 or COVID-SARS-2, the name of the virus. Because as I said at the beginning, this disease has come from wildlife. And every now and again, wildlife diseases jump across into human population and they can cause significant amounts of mortality, as we're seeing now. And what this, I think, should make us do is to make us think about our treatment of wildlife. If you live and you're eating and you're bringing wildlife into close proximity with humans, there is the risk that the disease can jump from wildlife to humans, but of course to vice versa. Hopefully we'll be on top of the coronavirus soon, but this is a warning of the types of things that could happen 
And it's entirely possible that coronavirus, as nasty as it, it is, there could be many worse diseases that could jump across. Ebola is one example that I mentioned earlier. So what we need to do is we need to work out ways in which we can coexist better with wildlife to prevent diseases from jumping across. And the reason we need to do this is because wildlife and the open spaces that they use, the habitats that they live in, are crucial for humanity. They contain wildlife, but those wildlife maintain those species, those ecosystems, and those ecosystems can provide us with what are known as ecosystem services. Fresh air, clean water, green spaces to protect our mental health, and indeed tourism to see wildlife um, in its natural settings. And so one of the things that I'm really hopeful that will come from this awful pandemic that we're experiencing at the moment, and that hopefully we're able to put behind us soon, is that we will reassess our relationship with wildlife, and that we will learn to give wildlife its space, that we will learn to live better with wildlife, to not bring it in captivity, to not eat it, to not store it in wet markets, as has been the case in parts of the world. We share this world with wildlife, and wildlife is crucial to, it, to, to this planet and to our existence. So we need to find a way to live with it. But we need to find a way where diseases no, do not jump across. Now, there is much work being done on this at the moment by conservation biologists in Oxford and beyond. And if anything good comes out of this awful, awful situation we're in at the moment, I do hope that it's we learn to live better with wildlife and we reduce the opportunities for diseases to jump from wildlife to humans as they have done in this case. Thank you.